Will the U.S. ban energy and gold again? Well, this is a conversation that I am having today with Doomberg as we talk about how the United States and the developed world seems to be banning oil, natural gas, gas combustion vehicles, gold, Bitcoin, crypto, and anything that gets in the way of what their political ideology says. So we get into the energy markets, talking about what's going on in Europe as Germany shut down its final three nuclear reactors. What's going on with OPEC in the Middle East with energy? Then we jump into money, money as energy. We talk about the all-seeing eye of Sauron, the U.S. Treasury, and what they're trying to do, how they came after crypto with choke point 2.0, what potentially could be next for Bitcoin, how gold could be on their list next to ban, and so much more. This was another interview I've done with Doomberg, and this one did not disappoint. One of the best interviews we've done with them for sure. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. And I want to jump into the money side. And the reason why I said in the beginning, you know, energy and money is uh, if from, from a philosophical standpoint, I mean, money is just stored energy, right? It allows me to store my energy until I'm ready to deploy it into goods and services that I want in the future. And so it kind of sits in that money. So they're, so they're certainly tied together. Um, you know, a lot has been said about the end of the dollar. Um, I think you've written about the end of the dollar. Um, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, peace in the Middle East and these nations wanting to join with the BRICS. And then there's the whole rise of the BRICS and all those things. And not so much to get into the end of the dollar, but you made a point or you, you wrote an uh, article, an issue, um, talking about the overlap of gold and Bitcoin and how they could both potentially be targeted <laughs> by, uh, I don't know, U.S. authorities or uh, the powers that be to control the money supply. Um, if I frame that up right. Yeah. The piece we wrote is called Golden Handcuffs. Golden Handcuffs. That's what it was. And, you know, we, we, our views on crypto different than our views on Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, we, we've been pretty open eyed about all of this and um, given our sort of honest views on these things, which at various points has annoyed um, crypto people or Bitcoin enthusiasts or even gold enthusiasts as we did in this piece. But you're but coming around. The, I mean, the fact that you can break those two separately shows you, you've come a long way. Oh, no. I, we, <laughs> we, we, yeah, well, no, we've been pretty consistent in that regard from the early days. Um, so this, let me give you a side story. Um, I was on a podcast with Peter, um, What Bitcoin Did, and he pressed me. So, you know, at what price would you consider allocating some of your net worth into Bitcoin? Because, as you know, I'm a no-corner today. I said, you know, a couple of percent, I'd probably be interested at 5000 you know. Um, I figured, you know, let's get through Binance, let's get through Tether, let's get through all of the KYC AML. And if there's sort of a crypto winter, a deep crypto winter, you know, I'm a value investor, I would be interested. I could be interested to uh, call up my, my friend Lynn Alden and learn how to buy some Bitcoin, put it in cold storage and give it to my kids when I die. And I said the price I'd be interested to buy at would be around 5000 My Twitter feed is filled with crypto trolls saying, you know, as the price of Bitcoin has appreciated since then, are you still waiting for 5,000, yeah. loser? You know, like, blah, 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 blah. Like, and by the way, like, of the no-coiners in the world, I'm relatively friendly to the Bitcoin community, and this is no way to convert people, but I digress. Um, so, back to the piece. The echo chamber the, is a very small representation yeah. of, the, of the... I know. <laughs> but, you know, Twitter just hides... The algorithm on Twitter highlights these people into my notifications, and it's all I can do to not just wave block everybody, yeah. but I don't. Um, so, back to the piece. The overlap in the Venn diagram of the motivations behind the people who are interested in buying gold and the people who are interested in buying Bitcoin, that overlap is far more significant than the gold bugs would like to admit. They are both viewed as valuable things that can be held arm's length away from government. They are both viewed as sort of store of values. And they're both viewed as sort of having a certain amount of moneyness to them. And it is through that lens as that we have written critically about Operation Choke Point 2.0. Um, we're actually pretty friendly with Nick Carter, and and you know in the areas where we agree, we're quite friendly. In the areas where we disagree, we're polite to each other, and that, that's all I ever ask from somebody. And I think vice versa, he would say the same about his relationship with us. Um, it is undeniable that the U.S. government is cracking down on crypto by leveraging access to banking and weaponizing the dollar. Um, and all the people cheering that on right now. And look, we have many friends who are sort of anti-crypto, anti and, and there is a lot of fraud in the space. And Bitcoin maximalists would be the first to say there is a lot of fraud in the space, and they want that cleaned up to sort of, you know, uh, clear the, the field for, for sort of Bitcoin as an asset as opposed to crypto as securities. And Gary Gensler is 
working with the rest of the government. And we wrote a piece called Don Jerome, where we talked about the kneecapping of Signature Bank. Like, this is real. These, that, these precedents are dangerous. And they could be applied to gold. And one of the things, we talked about the dollarization earlier, and the heart of this piece, the thesis of this piece, is be careful what you wish for. Imagine a world where President Xi and Vladimir Putin and the rest of the Middle East and the BRICS countries get together and say, we've created a new currency. It's going to compete with the dollar. We're going to settle our trade uh, uh, balances, uh, imbalances with gold and gold skyrockets. Um, in that world, do you think that the very same people who are shutting down crypto um, aren't going to turn around and say, yeah, it's illegal to own gold in the U.S.? Yeah. Let, let's stick, with, we, let's st let's stick with the crypto piece for a second because I want to ask you questions on that. First of all, actually... Uh, stick with crypto. Let's go back to gold for a second. I uh, made a video publicly disagreeing with Ray Dalio because Ray Dalio said that he thinks that the government will make Bitcoin illegal because they made gold illegal in 1933. And I disagreed with that because I said the reason why they made gold illegal is because they needed gold and the gold was in the bank. It wasn't so much to protect people, uh, prevent another store of value. They needed the gold and they took the gold. Um, they don't need gold today. We're not on a gold standard. They don't need Bitcoin. Either. Unless... The BRICS countries, in partnership with the Middle Eastern oil producers, decide that international trade imbalances will be settled in part by gold, and then they will need gold again. Okay. And that is the exact point of our piece. Yeah. So then they would, so then they would need gold again, but they wouldn't need Bitcoin unless other nations announced they had Bitcoin. Um, so you said, you know, um, these other stores of value, and you said a key word that made me think, and you said moneyness. So I've often thought. Most people know not to store their value, store their wealth in fiat currency, which is why they buy real estate and they buy equities and they buy bonds and they buy all these other fine art and all these other stores of value. Um, and so if the government was going to come after gold or come after, come after Bitcoin because we don't want you to have another store of value, then are they going to take away every other store of value since nobody stores their value in money and dollars anyway? Uh, no. Um, because none of them are legitimate threats to so because they don't have back. the moneyness. Well, they are sort of clunky moneyness, right? Like um, everybody understands that there's some money laundering in fine watches and in um, you know desirable paintings, but that's at the margin, right? So if we go back, Ben Hunt, who is the author of Epsilon Theory, who is uh, a, br a brilliant thinker, and, and we consume a lot of content, and his is among the content that we regularly consume. He has a great analogy, which he describes the U.S. Treasury as the eye of Soren, which is the U.S. Treasury wants to see every transaction in the world because controlling money is, is power. And that's a model that really resonates with us that we have adapted into several of our pieces. And I agree with that as and, well. Right. And so to the extent that you know the Lightning Network and Bitcoin could potentially represent um, a significant volume of transactions outside of the purview of the U.S. government, they're probably not going to let that happen. How many real transactions are happening in fine paintings or watches? Very few. You know, the, the average sort of money launderer um, in, in sort of a developing world country buys a really expensive watch and then shows up, um, you know, at, at customs and, and the guard doesn't know that that watch is worth $30,000. And all of a sudden they land in sort of the Western U.S. dollar world with a watch they could sell at a pawn shop um, and, and fund themselves. You know, that, that's not really a material amount. Whereas if the entire value proposition of a crypto token, Bitcoin on the side, is to basically allow for peer-to-peer -peer transactions that circumvent uh, anti-money laundering know your customer. Look, we've, we've written several times, we're not huge fans of this. We are just giving you the realistic assessment in our view yeah. of what's likely to happen. We're not cheering for it, um, but it's probably going to happen. And so the Eye of Soren is the model that people should really internalize. And in our piece, Golden Handcuffs, we are talking about the hypothetical situation of what the gold bugs would seem to want, which is this BRICS, Middle Eastern oil, you know, China, um, new currency that finally reveals the fraudulent suppression of the price of gold by the big Western banks because there will be a physical market for gold um, that will, you know, lay bare um, the suppression, which I actually happen to think is true. I do believe the price of gold has been suppressed for decades. Um, and, and in that scenario, the very precedents that many gold bugs and sort of conservative old money types um, who look down on sort of the Bitcoin um, maxis of the world 
um, as they watch Operation Choke Point 2.0 unfold, they're cheering it, not realizing that these very same precedents could very easily be turned against them. And we laid out just how the propaganda would work in that piece. And by the way, that piece went super viral for us. It was among the strongest pieces we've ever published, both in reach and um, feedback. And you know, just you know, when you're a content producer, a content creator, um, you know a great piece when you put it out and it has impact. That piece was amongst the most impactful we've ever published. Because nice. I think it really opened people's eyes. Yeah. Like, hey, like, boy, by the way, like many in the crypto community were like, hey, the, the, this person is, you know, saying these things that, again, so when we it, get- It was, it was of, certainly um, an interesting perspective that I had never thought about. So uh, for everybody yeah. listening, just to kind of catch you up to speed, um, basically, I think if I have this right, um, <clears throat> because there's a list of sanctioned nations that we can't do business with, just like cryptocurrency could be tagged as going through some illicit transaction, um, gold could potentially be flagged as coming from some sanctioned nation and then melted down and mixed together. And now you have some sanctioned yeah. gold and with your existing gold. And since they can't control it, then they just kind of ban it. Right. Like it's the Trudeau cash of, right. you know, of gold bars. Like the, there's, and by the way, there's only so many sort of approved refineries, you know, gold smelters or whatever like that, that take gold and recast it. And those are point sources of, of regulatory action. Like if, if you can say, here's our very short list of refiners that uh, you know, amount to 98% of the volume, and we put to them the choice, you can continue to exist in the U.S. dollar system or you could be labeled a criminal, what do you think they're going to do? Yeah. I mean. And, and to catch everybody up on the all-seeing eye of Sauron, it was a great piece. Um, and, and basically, the the Treasury being this IC and, uh, all seen eye of Sauron wants to see every single transaction. But I think the beginning of that piece was actually part of the more important piece. Well, uh, equally as important to understand the context in that he talked about the growing um, kind of uh, growing fraud um, and manipulation that's been done inside the government. And he talked about one president. Who was that? Woodrow Wills or... Yeah, uh, I forget which, whatever present was, and 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 um, the amount of fraud, and and as the con as the government continues to kind of devolve into this, uh, you know, scheme of fraud and manipulation, the people are going to see this, and they're not going to be happy with it, and they're going to be discontent and and uprise against it. And in order to control that, uh, in order to, con to keep a lid on that, so to speak, they have to be able to see every single transaction and have all of the surveillance just to kind of keep the people in place and prevent them from uprising against that. Did I kind of summarize yeah, that let, correctly? Yeah. Let, let's give everybody um, uh, instructions on how to find this piece. Yeah. It's well worth reading. Yeah, it's we'll called to in, it in, pra the too. Yeah, in, in Praise of Bitcoin. If you just Google search In Praise of Bitcoin by Ben Hunt, you will find a really brilliant piece. It was written, I think, more than a year ago, a very, very prescient piece. And he details his direct interactions with you know, uh, members of the U.S. Treasury Department um, and, and, you know, Ben pulls no punches in that piece. And, and he, as you, uh, you know, just said, just, just described, he, he, he walks through how the need to see everything is ultimately all about surveillance. And for a test case of this, we need to look no further than China. Yeah. Right. And social credit scores and central bank digital currencies and, and all of these things. And, you know, um, you get labeled with conspiracy theory or, you know, not job when, when you start warning about these things, but, you know, if you don't warn about them early, um, it very quickly becomes too late. Yeah. And and I do believe that this is the ultimate end game here. I thought it was a great piece. I, I have to say I was very disappointed in his take a few weeks ago when everybody was talking about, you know, the rise of the BRICS currencies and this and that. And um, he started going after all the Bitcoiners for instigating fear and causing panic and telling people to get out and, and that if they would just keep their money in the banking system, maybe it wouldn't fall apart. Um I thought that was a so, pretty poor take. He he had said something about uh, uh, I forget how he said it. Like crypto bros, uh, get your money out of the bank. I forget what it was, but do you know what I'm talking about? Or about Silicon Valley Bank and the VCs? And yeah, and how how people wanting to get out of a sinking ship was actually going to cause the ship to go down faster. That's always true on a bank run, as you know. But um, you know, it's not panicking if you're first. It's sort of the old adage, yeah. right? Um, look, let's just actually take a step back because this is a really important point. Um, you don't have to agree with everything everybody says. Sure. My, our, our prism is as follows: Do they authentically believe what they're saying, and are they expressing it politely? Yeah. And as long as it passes those two tests, 
I can pick and choose what I like about what Mark Moss says and what about Ben Hunt yep. says and what Grant Williams says and what pick your favorite content creator says or influencer or market commentary person. And, and that's a great you point don't. to bring up because there's pretty much nobody you're going to agree with everything and you have to be able to understand that nuance. Across, and look, that's our, that's our phrase, which is, do they authentically believe it? I.e., I don't like to listen to frauds who are knowingly telling a lie right. to achieve a different purpose. Yeah. And I don't like people who are trolls, right. who are rude and in your face because they might authentically believe it, but they don't have the common decency to exchange in polite discourse. Right. If you pass those first two screens where you authentically believe it and you're expressing it politely, look, there are certain views. Obviously, everybody has the limits, you know, like um, we, we can imagine everybody's, you know, guardrails and, and red lines. But by and large, 99% of the people color within the lines of, what's socially acceptable discourse. And as long as they authentically believe what they're saying and they express it politely, I have infinite patience for people's opinions that I disagree with. And sometimes I even prefer to have conversations with those people. If you can have a polite... that's how you learn. Yeah, if you can have exactly. a polite discussion, intelligent discussion, yeah, you learn, you sharpen your, your, your discussion, you kind of understand where your weak points are. So sometimes I even prefer yeah. that. Let me give you a great example of this. So I, I participated in a debate on Jack Farrelly's podcast, um, Forward Guidance with um, a professor um, named um, Stephen Keen. And brilliant guy has some radical views about what should be done about climate change. And we spent the better part of, I think, an hour, an hour and a half going over this debate. And he was expressing some, some pretty, let's just say, out there views on nationalizing the energy sector, rationing, you know, cutting our energy use by 30, 40, 50, 60 percent and what that would necessarily mean and and so on and so on. And I was extremely polite with Professor Keene. Why? He, he came to these views authentically. He believes them. He expressed them politely. We concentrated on the things we agreed with and then discussed the things we disagreed with. And um, in the end, uh, we got along well. And uh, it was a very great discussion. He made me think about a few things. I think I made him think about a few things. And the comments were just crushing this guy because of his beliefs. Right. Um, but in the end, like, he's way, way better than sort of the environmentalists we talked about earlier who are trying to play the sleight of hand. Like, he's very open about what his solutions would mean, and God bless him for being so. Yeah. Like, at least he has the decency to, to, to be level with people about what he feels needs to be done as radical and as a, uh, you know, extreme as that might sound to somebody who's never heard it before. The reason why it sounds radical and extreme is because there's a whole army of people who refuse to tell the truth. This guy at least told the truth and I commend him for it. So I was more than happy to engage in an hour long debate with this guy. And um, people were complimenting me on the fact that I sort of kept my cool. Like, what do you mean lose my cool? The guy was being honest. He was being authentic. He expressed his views politely. You could disagree with them, but at least you know where he stands and why. And, and there's, Far too little of that in our discourse today, and and especially in sort of the sort of Bitcoin crypto um, crowd, in, in my view. Yeah, no, there certainly is. I agree, and 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 most people listening, you know, most of the the observers and and, and I mean and participants alike, they just don't understand the nuance that's in there. And what I've found is a lot of times you get people just just disagreeing till till death. It seems like bonds are great. No, bonds are the best. And then you get them together, and well. Bonds are really good right now in the short term, but they're horrible in the long term. Oh, we agree. <laughs> and so a lot of times there's a lot of that in that nuance. Um, and sometimes they're not, but, but as long as you can intelligently discuss it. I want to go back to um, the um, choke point 2.0 and kind of what you're talking about with Nick Carter's piece and then the kind of the Bitcoin crypto piece. And so uh, certainly, you know, you see that choke point 2.0, you know, where Signature Bank, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, et cetera, um, were kind of, Silvergate Bank, et cetera, were kind of taken down. Those were like crypto-friendly banks. And it certainly seems like there is an attack to choke point crypto. But kind of you also made a comment, which is a lot of the Bitcoin people are uh, also agree there's a lot of fraud that's going on there. And from a Bitcoin, not crypto perspective, it seems like it's certainly a concerted effort to target crypto, but not Bitcoin. Now, we know Gary Gensler. I don't know if you saw, or I think it was today I tweeted about it. Uh, Hester Pierce came out and it was on, mm -hmm. it was on uh, Zero Hedge and basically came out and dissented with, you know, Gary Gensler's SEC and said, look, these guys are basically trying to pass all this regulation, just get rid of uh, um 
any kind of progress. I'm not for that. But it seems like the SEC is coming super heavy handed against all the, you know, everything, all the regulations on the exchanges, et cetera. But he's also at the same time continued to say over and over, you know, Bitcoin is a commodity. Um, it's not a security, nothing else, et cetera. And so when you look at this choke point 2.0 specifically, I mean, from the banking sector, FDIC, Fed, but also from the SEC, it seems to be more targeted towards crypto and not Bitcoin. And so what I would say about that is like, if you look at some of the Bitcoin companies, they've had no problem with their banks. They've had no banks, no, sure. no bank problems. Nothing's been shut down. Um, so here's the cautionary tale that I would have for that. So you're 100% accurate in the way that you framed it. Um, Gary Gensler has routinely said that Bitcoin is an asset. The IRS taxes Bitcoin as an asset. And as long as you have the receipts for what you paid for it and what you would eventually sell it for, and you've held it for a certain period of time, it's either a short or a long-term capital gain. And as long as you honestly report all of your transactions, then you are legally clean to buy and sell Bitcoin today. Here's the challenge. If you take the logic behind Operation Choke Point uh, 2.0 to its logical conclusion, we see a world where peer-to-peer -peer trading of Bitcoin um, within sort of a walled off system, uh, I'll, I'll send you Bitcoin and you can send me, pick your favorite, um, might be okay, but the, the fiat rails will be closed off because the rest of the world could trade Bitcoin without KYC AML. Right. And so there is risk here for Bitcoin in the long term. In the, in the intermediate term, there is a world where crypto trading ceases, but Bitcoin trading is still allowed to be listed. So if you take Bittrex, which was you know, basically all but shut down today based on the SEC's um, civil charges. Um, they were slammed for listing various crypto assets that Gensler calls securities. But as long as they said, I'm going to apply to be just a Bitcoin exchange, um, they probably could have gotten approval. Um, and so there's no question that Gensler is treating Bitcoin separately from the rest of the crypto world. But the deductive reasoning of sort of how this plays out in the years to come, there is still some risk to Bitcoin in our view, um, in two, three, four years down the road. Yeah. Two, three, four years down the road, it could be a, a different story. You know, I think um, just in regards to that, I mean, we, a lot of times we get caught up in this uh, very U.S. centric viewpoint um, or developed world's viewpoint or whatever. But, you know, most people don't make change until the pain is high enough, like an addict that doesn't want to get rehab until they hit rock bottom. And so, you know, in the United States and in Europe, et cetera, you know, the pain isn't super high, but for 3 billion people living under very, very harsh authoritarian regimes and double to triple digit inflation, like the pain is pretty high. And so we're seeing massive adoption, you know, 80% of all Bitcoin transactions under a thousand dollars are being done in Africa. Right. Yep. And so, um, you know, while the U.S. could certainly continue to crack down on it, um, you have a lot of people, you know, and, 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 you know, around the world, but also even the United States, if you look at the millennial generation and younger, they have no assets. And so pay me in Bitcoin. I'll spend in Bitcoin. I'll stay in Bitcoin. I'll never touch the fiat rail. And good luck. Right. Yep. And look, I mean, th that use case is real um, and it's real because there is a network effect for Bitcoin. And that is completely outside of the purview of what we've been discussing so far, which is the U.S. dollar regulated system. Yeah. Right. And those are two completely separate things. Um, we've never argued that there isn't a massive use case for some form of cryptocurrency in the developed world where um, surveillance or you know dictatorships or uh, rapid debasement of money is a way of life and people just don't trust it or they can't. They don't have access to banking and they can't send value to a relative on the other side of the country and so on and so on and so on. And so the spontaneous growth of moneyness in worlds where it is in deep, deep um, a deficit uh, doesn't surprise us and is, in fact, a very valid use case. None of those things exist in the sort of regulated U.S. dollar system today in the United States for most law abiding citizens. And therefore, if the government made gold owning, you know, the owning of gold illegal, Look, I, I, I exist in the U.S. dollar regulated system. I have children. I have a, a, a child that's going to college in the fall. I've created a good life. I have a good reputation. I have good friends. If tomorrow the U.S. government said owning gold is illegal, I would be turning in my gold. I, I make no bones about it. As much as I have gold for the variety of things that we've talked about, and I like having gold, and gold is a way for me to feel like I'm preserving some value for my children, 
um, if the government made it illegal, it would be very difficult for me to choose to be an outlaw. Yeah. And for the vast majority of people in the United States, if they made the ownership of Bitcoin illegal, it'd be very difficult for people to break the law. Many of them. Um, not all of them. There's certainly a small minority of people who would be holdouts. And there was a small minority of people who hid their gold from the government in the 30s when yeah. Roosevelt made it illegal. Um, but Whatever gold no wasn't question. already in the banks. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If you owned a shoebox full of gold when they made it illegal and you hid it from the government, look, you had to do it for 50 years. Yeah. But when Ford finally lifted it, you, you were singing, you know, the happy times. Yeah. Well, we could go on on that. I mean, uh, one thing I always like to point is, is just uh, the the war on drugs hasn't worked out too well. But I don't want I don't want exactly. to continue to beat that horse. <laughs> um, I will say, uh, just say that, you know, when the government tells you not to do drugs, it doesn't make you want to do drugs. But when they do tell you you don't have a way to store your wealth in a way we can't steal from you, it's sort of like when they talk about cracking down on guns, what happens to gun sales, right? So um, 100%. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that see how that plays out. And then, and then again, remembering we have a global game being played, right? And so as nations move to gold or, or move to Bitcoin, uh, the, the U.S. would only be shooting themselves in the foot um, doing that. But um, I want to go, I want to get your take on another piece that's uh, at the intersection of, of, of kind of your, your kind of uh, main viewpoint. And, and that's this New York Times hit piece on Bitcoin. So uh, for the listeners, New York Times came out with a piece talking about, you know, Bitcoin mining in, in, um, in Texas. And I mean, it seemed to be a complete hit piece full of all types of errors um, in there. Did you take a look at that? And what's your kind of appraisal of that? Um, so I've not read that piece in particular, but we have put a piece out on Bitcoin mining um, okay. where we gave what I thought was a relatively... Um, balanced view. The piece was called um, A Fine Mess, which we published in November uh, of 2020. I have to tell you, I have to tell you, Doomberg, your ability to recall all your issues with the names and everything <laughs> is great for marketing. Well, as you're on all these when, shows. When, <laughs> when you when you live and sleep and eat and dream a business, the work of my life that Doomberg is, um, it's not hard to remember these things. So in, in A Fine Mess, we described how there is, in fact, a valid use case for Bitcoin mining if you're insistent upon introducing intermittent renewables into a grid, and that use case is as follows. In order to have an ever-growing presence of renewables onto a grid and to maintain grid stability, um, you need to have backup power plants in the form of predominantly natural gas peaker plants, as we would call them. And it is uneconomical for private actors to have peaking plants um, as a business because by definition, you're only needed when you are. And when you're not needed, which is most of the time, you have no outlet for your, um, your fixed costs. You cannot cover those fixed costs. And so in a world where Bitcoin is valuable and it needs to be mined, there is an economic inducement to create peaker plants, which allows for an introduction of more renewables into the grid, which in theory allows for the carbon intensity of your grid to be decreased. Um, and it allows for the owners of these peaker plants to make a reasonable uh, return on capital. Now, as we said in that piece, um, as I recall, we, pro we profiled Senator Warren's comments um, in this regard. Um, none of that is going to carry, carry sway. <laughs> like, they're going to shut down Bitcoin mining in the U.S. and they're going to use the same environmental hammer that they have used to shut down natural gas pipelines, even though replacing coal with natural gas is decidedly and provably less carbon intense. Um, and so um, we wrote a relatively sympathetic piece on Bitcoin mining, which made us no friends in the sort of hardcore anti-crypto community. Um, but we did so because we believed it to be true. And, and there's a nuanced take here. Um, but also in that piece, we said quite definitively that we don't think this is, these arguments are going to carry the day. But there is an argument to be made, and it's a shame that nobody's listening to it. So, um, again, um, in a world where um, there's only sort of black and white, um, writing articles that describe a little bit of gray doesn't make you too many fans, mm -hmm. but it, it allows you to be uh, consistent with your, your sort of ideology. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to, to your point, uh, that, that it's not going to win you a lot of friends, and they're going to do what they're going to do, I guess, either way. I think uh, in that article, it was just so full of errors, including – they had the name of the town wrong? <laughs> oh, look. I mean, look, the, the New York Times, the, the traditional sort of me. Why is Doomberg successful? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Like, because, um, you know, we, when we have an agenda, we lay it out and we admit it. 
so that people can then read our authentically held opinions politely expressed through that lens. You know, we've been debating whether to write a piece about this whole Twitter and Substack fiasco with, you know, Elon Musk trying to block Substack links and Substack creating a, a, an alternative to Twitter. And, and if we were to ever write that piece, the very first paragraph after the cut to paid would be, here's all of our biases. We make our money on Substack. We might invest in Substack. You should view everything we write through that lens, right? And so if the New York Times had come out and said, here's our biases, um, we want to write a piece that makes Bitcoin mining look terrible, then at least you could read it through that lens. But they, that paragraph is missing from that piece. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the real problem with it. But we've, I, I think from one standpoint, I think it's good because it just continues to um, undermine any shred of authority that might have been left in any of this mainstream media. Um, that interview that Elon Musk did with the BBC reporter had 3.3 million people tuning in compared to just hundreds of thousands that might tune into CNN. 3.3 million people tuning in and just made him, exposed him as a liar right in front of everybody. And so, you know, yeah. maybe maybe under maybe these institutions undermining themselves might go a long way to helping turn the so, tide of this. I would say, as beneficial as it is for us, that these institutions continue to undermine themselves. It is not good for society that the main news organizations in the country have lost the confidence of a significant part of the population. That is not healthy. Why is it, it leads not to healthy? social unrest? It leads to social unrest. Like if people truly think the government is lying to them and that the media is just an extension of the government, that's not good for the institutions. It's not good for societal um, discourse is not good for societal stability. And ultimately, um, hey, I have a really good room in the Titanic. Doesn't mean that you're still not on the Titanic. You know what I'm saying? And so um, there's, there's still damage that the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN and Fox News and MSNBC behave in these ways. Very few people trust the media. Um, that's not good. Well, um, I mean, it, it is good when they continue to, 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 to spew lies. So I think... Well, my point, that they spew lies is not good. No, it's not, it's not good. I agree. Well, uh, let, let's take this leak. Let's take this, this leak of the, you know, the, the defense intel and the war in Ukraine and all that stuff. And they arrested this 21-year-old kid you know, with all the cameras rolling. Find me an article in the, in the traditional media that talks about the content of what was leaked and the importance of what's being covered up versus the crimes that this kid allegedly committed. Right. Right. Like if the government is committing crimes and somebody leaks that to the press, when I grew up, that was called a whistleblower. Right. Not a criminal. And Obama said he was going to protect whistleblowers, but we didn't see that happen. Well, exactly. So my point is, if nobody believes or trusts the media, that is not a good thing for society. Now, if you shouldn't trust the media, which is what I think you're trying to say, the more they lie, the better it is, because at least everybody knows they shouldn't trust the media. Right. Uh, but that's not a good thing. No, I agree. It's society. not a good thing. And it's very easy to fix. Like, to your point, you expose your biases at the beginning of the piece. And yeah. uh, the way that you stop uh, you know, people's imaginations running wild and conspiracy theories running wild is truth and transparency. Correct. Pretty easy 100%. to stop. Look, yeah. And, and again, like, we're not professional journalists, but we try to be professional in our journalism. Right. Um, so if we're writing about a company and somebody on our team has a ownership position in the stock in that company, we, we would disclose it. More likely, we would just not write the piece um, because even if you disclose it, it makes you very difficult. You know, like if, if we have an investment interest in an entity that we're writing about, um, how could we be impartial, you know? And, and so that's just one small example. We always try to set our sources and, you know, et cetera. But, um, and, and when we do have our biases, we, we, we try to be as authentic with our audience as possible. Like we have many, many people who are Bitcoin enthusiasts who subscribe to Doomberg and we're proud of that, even though we've written very critically about the crypto space, for example, or, or predicted that, uh, you know, there would be a, a regulatory crackdown that might affect the price of Bitcoin or that, you know, that we believe that the price of Bitcoin is artificially inflated by Tether and until Tether's resolved, um, you know, it'd be very difficult for us to consider investing in this space. Um, people don't like it when we say that, but they respect the fact that we're at least expressing our views authentically and politely. And that's all we really need in society. And too much of that is lacking, unfortunately. So, you know, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a lot of things that have been happening in the energy markets. I mean, 
Well, it's a, a lot of things happening. Specifically, just this week, just a couple of days ago, Germany decided to shut down their final three nuclear reactors. Uh, I think overnight, their energy prices went up by about almost 50%. Um, give me, give me, give me your take on that. I thought they were going to keep them open. I mean, that seemed to have kind of caught me off guard. Uh, what's, what's going on with Germany? When the full history of why it is that the German greens in particular are so religiously maniacally obsessed with removing cheap, carbon free, reliable and safe nuclear power from their grid. When that full history is written, it can't be that there won't be something that will shock us um, when we sort of peel the onion back and find out what the true drivers of the motivations of the people behind this movement were. Because by all measures, scientific, economic, political, it is just about the stupidest policy on display in the world today. I mean, there's no other way to say it. Um, having survived the winter of 22, 23, and we can define what survived means, um, because of really, you know, the miracle of Gaia, the weather was a three to four sigma winter for them on the warm side. And we've been warning um, in the face of many trolls on Twitter saying, you know, you were alarmist, yada, 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 that um, let's not confuse um, luck with, with intellect and let's right. not draw all the wrong lessons from this natural miracle that has um, befallen um, Germany and, and Western Europe. And yet, it seems as though the, the politicians in Germany are hell-bent on drawing all the wrong conclusions from this spell of good fortune and have decided to remove the last remaining nuclear reactors. And to be fair, um, there's a, a dozen or so reactors they could turn back on tomorrow and solve much of their energy crisis um, literally overnight. I, I'm convinced of it. But regardless, um, they have followed through. And as you mentioned, in, in certain regions in Germany, I don't know how representative it is, but our, our, our good friend Mark Nelson tweeted that there was a a 45% increase in the electricity bill uh, for one of the major you know, power providers in, in Germany, which really is only the beginning. And, and, and I want to circle back to what I said you know, earlier when I said they survived the winter. Well, what does survive mean? Right. They spent a half a trillion dollars buying every B, BTU of energy around the world that they could find, regardless of price, um, carbon footprint, or impact on the developing world. And, and through that Herculean effort, in combination with a miraculously warm winter, they were able to muddle through uh, and get to spring. And yet, despite all of that, and despite the massive deindustrialization that's occurring within Germany, which we're writing about in a future piece, they still shut down their last three remaining nuclear power plants. And it makes it very difficult for people to feel sympathetic towards the Germans should they encounter any difficulties this winter. Uh, we have long said that we're not sitting here hoping for a calamity to quote unquote be proven right in this regard. We'd much rather be accused of, of being alarmist um, if that means we could spare the many thousands of subscribers we have in Europe from any hardship, for example, like viscerally for our business. It wouldn't be good. Um, but it does stretch. It stretches it, man. It makes it very, very difficult to feel sympathetic. We keep reminding ourselves um, these are the political leaders, not the people. It's okay to feel uh, frustrated with the pol political leaders, but the people are the victims here, and let's hope that they are not victimized um, next winter. You said what? Let's define what surviving looks like, and then you kind of said muddling through. But I think the the piece was surviving meant that sure there was luck, you know, some preparation. You know, they managed to get kind of their storage tanks full. Yes, they overspent and they bought everything up that you said, like, you know, like you said. But still, you said in spite of. But what surviving looks like is they did take a massive hit to their industrial uh, base, and yeah. a lot of those companies that have moved out are not coming back. Right, that's like almost irreparable. Right. So, you know, by surviving, what we mean is, you know, people on Twitter are saying, oh, there's nobody uh, huddling, uh, right. sh you know, Dying. in the streets, um, freezing to death. Um, but uh, like you say, you know, uh, in running string on this piece that we're going to write probably next week sometime on, on this whole fiasco, um, BSF, of course, is the, the German chemical giant, and, and um, they are responsible for many of the innovations that um, the entire world has benefited from in the chemical industry. They're really iconic. I mean, they... They discovered the Haber process for ammonia and, you know, 
and so on. We've written about them before in a piece last year called Moribund Verdun. Um, they are essentially um, restructuring their operations in Germany and building out their operations in China. Right. And uh, guess where China is getting all the commodities that they need to run the chemical industry from Russia. Of course. And so you have, you know, <laughs> you have these these super fun sites, you know, these um, these these massively integrated chemical complexes like Ludwigshaven in Germany that have been operational for 80 plus years, just powering the economic engine of the country. And um, they are firing people, shutting down plants and uplifting all of that expertise and moving it to China. And they're just going to tap Russian commodities to make those chemicals and sell them into the Chinese market. And the CEO of BSF on an earnings call recently said, if it weren't for our Chinese operations, we would not have been able to fund the restructuring in Germany. And what that means is the profits we're making in China are helping us pay for the severance packages and the cleanup costs of shutting down factories in Germany. It's now, how this is, quote, <laughs> yeah. the money this, we make how this is, Go ahead. how this is surviving. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, you, you, we'll talk about, um, you know, a strange victory, strange defeat here to quote, um, you know, my, my favorite rock band, the Silver Jews. This, this is obscenely insane what's going on in Germany. And uh, it really is just fascinating to watch. Now, the last point I'll make is at least it's unabashedly bullish for Doomberg because we will never run out of things to write about. Right. Yeah. So they the money they made in China paid for them to leave Germany. What a, what a deal. And, and to your point, the irony of them, <clears throat> they can't buy German commodities, cheap German commodities, so they're forced to leave and go to China. But the commodities they're buying in China are coming from Russia. The Effectively, irony. I mean, they're commingled at some point. You know, some of them sure. are you know sourced locally, but I mean, yeah. And one of the biggest outlets for Russian commodities is China and India and so on. And if you're pulling up, you know, shop in China in Germany and relocating to China, well, yeah, you went from sourcing cheap Russian commodities in Germany to sourcing cheap Russian commodities in China. And, and the net effect of the German policy is to just push, you know, to deindustrialize, as we said. And and it's a shame. Um, actually, because the German economic miracle was one to admire, and uh, they seem to be doing their level best to uh, dismantle it, and it, it is a true tragedy, and it's not one to um, it's not one to take lightly. I think we in the in the in the U.S. in particular need to be observing the consequences of this insane policy and um, well, you know activating ourselves politically to, to to organize against it. The the problem is is we've uh, done the same thing in many many cases. So I mean, you can just look at you know the activist takeover of Exxon and divesting um, from a lot of their projects, and then China just coming in and scooping those up. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, off the coast of Vietnam, and pick your favorite. Yeah, right. No and so it. it 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 seems like it's constantly just you know deindustrializing or or moving away from these energy projects and just seemingly handing them over to China. I mean, even back to Iraq, I, you know, I remember a lot of people were like, Oh, we're just going there for the oil. We're going to take the oil. And I don't think the U S really ever got any oil from Iraq. I, we, we helped them become an oil producing nation. And now is China the big beneficiary over there? Well, it's funny. You should mention that because we're publishing a piece tomorrow, um, on this and, um, it's probably going to be one of our more controversial ones, but we're looking at what a, a unified Middle East um, with China in the middle of it means for U.S. policy. And, and you know, um, the piece is titled Uniting Nations, uh, Uniting States, I'm sorry, um, Uniting States. And, and um, we, we, we look at the fact that, you know, China brokered a peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia with its Saudi first policy. And all of a sudden, Bahrain and Qatar are, are coming back to terms. And, and you're beginning to see signs of a united Middle East aligning with the BRICS. And, you know, with all of the blood and treasure that we expended in the Middle East over the decades, it is really quite a sort of an unfortunate end to U.S. Um, dominance in that region and, and one that has significant repercussions for, for the energy markets. I will say um, the U.S. still has 60 nuclear reactors, and outside of New England and California, there is still an awful lot of um, oil and gas production. We're still an energy superpower. We have a long way to go before our policy, you know, puts us in a similar position to Germany. Um, but I just want to make sure I pointed that out, that while there is, there's still plenty worth saving over here, as we observe Germany, you know, um, dive off of the energy cliff, um, uh, you know, so let, let's not lose sight of the fact there's still political, uh, still things worth defending politically in the U.S. Of course. I mean, we have, we have to defend it as long as we can, right? Uh, fight for it. I, it. It doesn't make any, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense, period. And I, I constantly go back and forth asking myself, is this, is this evil or incompetence? And I tend to usually default to incompetence. Uh, maybe it's just, I'm assuming the best out of people. Um, but 
you kind of have to wonder, it's almost like it is, is somewhat deliberate. And I think I'm curious to you, I mean, do you really try to kind of zoom out and look at the geopolitical picture to try to make sense of this? So for Germany in particular, there's a long history of suspicion that Russian um, agents were funding much of the anti-fracking and anti-nuclear power uh, movements in continental Europe. Um, that's a relatively controversial thing to say. There's an awful lot of evidence that points to that. And, and frankly, um, who benefited the most over the past decade from this foolhardy set of policies? I mean, sure. So it, you know, it doesn't take much. Um, now, having said that, with the controversy around the Nord Stream pipeline explosions and you know, uh, Seymour Hersh accusing the U.S. of having blown those up, there's some, some school of thought that says you know, U.S. LNG exporters are certainly happy with the, the suite of decisions that the Germans are making, but um, not quite ready to go there. Um, but at the same time, like, at, at what point, like, somebody is making a really dumb decision, and it doesn't benefit any Germans. So who does benefit from it and who paid for it would be very fascinating questions to answer. What well, benefits the that. Chinese? You know, I've thought like, you know, China has a bunch of coal. They don't have the petrochemicals. They don't have the oil or natural gas. They're not really, a, they're, they're nowhere near a, you know, energy de independent or superpower in that, in that realm. Um, but as most of the developed world gets rid of their oil and natural gas development and tries to switch to wind and solar, doesn't that push the energy right back to China? Right. So what, what does China have? They don't have coal. and Well, they have coal, but they don't have oil and gas, as you mentioned. Um, but they do have 90 to 98 percent stranglehold on all of the solar supply chain, um, which, you know, with the ESG movement mandating the deployment of such technologies in the West, that creates fixed demand for Chinese products and profits that flow back into China. Um, and they're also building out nuclear as fast as they can. Right. Um, so watch what they're doing and not what they're saying. Um, and so once they finish with their nuclear build out, they will be far, far, far along the path of uh, energy independence where they could buy the, the delta of what they need in the open market in exchange for their manufacturing capacity and so on and so forth. And so um, as we outline in the piece, like love them or hate them, the, the Chinese are, are playing a long term strategic game and it behooves us to understand um, how they're exploiting our weaknesses, especially in the Middle East uh, at this time. And so one of the things that has happened recently, of course, is um, uh, in addition to you know, Saudi Arabia making peace with Iran, we have all of a sudden the war in Yemen seems to be um, reaching a, a peace deal, which is, of course, brokered by, uh, by China probably in the background. And then Saudi Arabia investing um, big time into um, Chinese refining, uh, refining capacity, which means that you know this they're probably going to make sure that the Half a, half a million barrels a day of oil that that refining capacity um, that Saudi Arabia is investing in um, can consume will be supplied with, uh, with very good regularity. And so um, in exchange, they'll probably get some finished goods and some of the profits from the refinery and so on. And so you see this ever tightening relationship between China and Saudi Arabia, China and Iran, um, China and the rest of the Middle Eastern oil producers. Um, and, and you wonder what it is that we're doing um, over here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm curious then um, for your news for the Doomberg newsletter, which for everybody listening, they should check it out. We'll make sure to put a link down in the description down below. Um, I'm a subscriber to it. I think it's awesome. I'm just curious then um, the writing that you do. I mean, I don't feel that it's just for entertainment. I mean, you made the comment earlier. Maybe we can help some of our thousands of subscribers over in Europe kind of navigate this. So. Um, do you write this with the intention that, you know, potentially people could get this information and somehow front run it or uh, potentially, you know, somehow save themselves from this? So we don't give investment advice um, and we hold no licenses and um, everybody's, you know, portfolio is unique. Our objective is to teach um, non-finance concepts to finance professionals in a language they can understand and to entertain them in the process. And so um, we give, you know, we're sort of a, a quasi opinion driven reporting team. We will report on facts and details, connect dots, and use our technology and business and finance backgrounds to um, tell a narrative that um, allows sophisticated investors to assess a situation, understand what it might mean for their own portfolios, and then perhaps take an investment decision on their own with, with our sort of um, speculation slash reporting slash opinions as an input into that. But mm -hmm. um, we, we are not, uh, you know, investment advisors and so on. And and um, and so our objective is to sort of 
lean into our science background and explain molecularly and at the physics level what must occur eventually without any sort of reference for timing and um, allow investors to make their own decisions um, accordingly. And so we view ourselves more as a, uh, you know, 80% education, 20% entertainment um, wrapped in as good a writing as we can do that's tightly edited, that doesn't take too much of people's time. Our objective is whenever our piece lands in your inbox, Mark, your gut feeling is, ooh, I get to read that. Right. Um, and, and that's our brand. And if we could execute that brand vision in enough ideal clients, you know, like yourself, thank you for being a subscriber. Um, then and only then can we say that we have a brand. Uh, right. But yeah, we, we, we are not, um, hey, go buy, you know, uh, Bitcoin at 29,000 and sell it at 30,500. That, right. That's not what we do. Right. So uh, go, going back into these energy markets, I was just kind of curious as, as kind of the, you know, the purpose of that content. Um, and I just want people to hear that. Obviously, I subscribe to it. So I know, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people want to stay out of politics, but it seems like you kind of have to understand politics to kind of understand where this is going if you want to navigate this correctly. And so kind of to your point, you know, you see China over in the Middle East kind of brokering peace, which seems kind of, uh, you know, uh, obviously if you're a U.S. person, it seems uh, somewhat scary to see China taking that position. Um and then you kind of have to kind of imagine uh, where that goes and then what happens in the United States from there. Um, I'm curious, though, since you're kind of coming from this uh, more of a, uh, what's the word? You used it. But, uh, you know, you, you know, you, you're, were you, a, were you an engineer in the space? I was a scientist. A scientist. Okay. So from, from a scientist, engineering yeah. standpoint, and you've done, done amazing work, you know, breaking down how hydrogen uses more energy than it saves and things like that. So I'm curious in, in that vein, um, looking at like what Germany's done by shutting down nuclear reactors, moving uh, towards um, wind and solar, relying on that. Um, and looking at, there was a report that came out by Goldman Sachs, I believe I saw it somewhere, I don't know, eight, nine months ago. And they were talking about how there was like, $3.8 trillion spent in the last decade, I believe, to move uh, fossil fuels from 83 to 82%. Um, and yeah. Then, <laughs> right. And that, but that was, that was at the end of 2020, I believe, or end of 2021. And now I'm guessing uh, after this energy crisis, now we've had an increase going back to coal as well as burning uh, wood. Uh, any guess as to what that might have done to the fossil fuel number? Do you think that could have potentially pushed it back from 82 to 81 and now maybe up to 83 could it have gone I backwards would, i would say that is um indistinguishable from zero variance in other words um here, here's sort of the one of the fundamental challenges this there's this phenomenon in the energy markets called the efficiency paradox there's another name for it that escapes me as we're talking live but it goes like this um when they invented the steam engine um the whole point of inventing the steam engine was to make the mining of coal easier what resulted wasn't that we just used the same amount of coal, but the price went down. What happened was the demand and utilization of coal skyrocketed as it became more and more efficient to mine for coal. Mm -hmm. And so over time, since energy is life and your standard of living is literally defined by how much energy you get to waste, the more efficient did you, did we make you say, Did you say your energy is defined or your life is defined by how much energy you get to waste? Your, 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 your standard of living is literally defined by how much energy you get to waste. Or use. Um, <laughs> no, well, I mean, no, you have to waste heat to create order. This okay. is a physics phrase. I, when I say waste, that has a different connotation than okay. sort of the standard ear. But um, in order to impose order on your local environment, you must waste heat. The amount of water you can pose on your local environment is a measure of your standard of living. All humans everywhere want a higher standard of living. Therefore, the amount of waste, uh, the wasted heat that you can, you can parlay into your local environment defines how wealthy you are. And everybody wants to be wealthier. Now, um, let's imagine that we have um, an abundance of, of cheap energy. What's going to happen? It's not like everyone is going to satiate themselves to maintain their current standard of living and be happy that it's slightly cheaper. No, they're going to use the maximum amount they can within their budget because everybody wants a better life. Right. And so um, we can spend $10 trillion. We could spend $100 trillion. The amount of, of fossil fuels we're going to burn is, is uh, as a percentage of our energy suite, is, is absent some radical invention or a sweeping adoption of nuclear power. 
um, is going to be maintained because ultimately, if other energy sources um, become abundant, then the price of natural gas and oil and coal will plummet. And then people will say, wow, you know, I could buy natural gas for 10 cents a million BTU. I'm probably going to build a factory around that, absent some legal prohibition from doing so. And there will be vast swaths of the world that will have no such prohibitions. So we wrote a piece um, basically pointing out that because of Germany's, um, you know, the, the, um, the, their quote unquote success in getting through the winter, um, the rest of the world uh, looked at what they did uh, and decided that, okay, we're going to go back to coal. And the piece was called the Streisand Effect. We published it on February 27th. Um, China, Indonesia, um, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, India, pick your favorite. Like, we were talking billions of people, like vast swaths of the earth, um, are looking at what Germany did and not what they said. And they said, aha, you don't mean it. We're not going to be able to rely on LNG, and renewables is not going to cut it for us. So we're just going to go back to burning coal. You know, and they're going to. And who, who, who are we to tell billions of people that they should uh, remain in energy poverty when they have access to their own domestic or regional coal supplies? Uh, and they will go tap those. They just will. And so um, if the rest of the world, the Western world, um, miraculously finds itself no longer needing fossil fuels, the rest of the world that doesn't have this miraculous technology, unnamed, um, will just go ahead and take up those excess fossil fuels to increase their standard of living. Right. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that we spend trillions of dollars and not move the needle because cheap energy is always going to be used. Hmm. Yeah, good point. So that, that's also sort of like a failed metric to look at because, uh, to your point, uh, as, as we get off of that or developed world gets off of that, then the, the emerging markets will just well, pick it up. Let's just pick, a, pick apart a little bit. So first of all, you're talking about percentage. Okay, what is the mix within fossil fuels? If we're using much more natural gas than coal, then our carbon emissions have come down for the same amount of energy use, right? And right. so we've long argued that the metric we should be organizing ourselves around in the economy is as follows. In the numerator, total standard of living we can distribute to the population of humans on the planet divided by our carbon emissions. You need to measure both. And by the way, in the numerator, how equitably we distribute that standard of living is a whole other question. Um, but by and large, there's a whole lot of questions in there, but yeah. <laughs> yes. But everybody wants a higher standard of living. So if we could have a much higher standard of living with the same carbon emissions, that's a undeniably good thing. Environmentalists would say it isn't because we need to quote, reduce our carbon emissions. Okay. At what cost of people's standard of living and politically, how are you going to run on it? Yeah. Right. And that's the sleight of hand. They talk about the need to reduce carbon emissions without coming clean on what it means for people's standard of living. And if you come clean on what it means for people's standard of living and you are able to get popular support for your policies, then go ahead and implement them. It's the sleight of hand that offends us, yeah. which is to say you can cut your carbon emissions without consequence of standard of living. And the fact that we have these carbon emissions is nothing more than the evil conspiracy of the fossil fuel industry, which is totally and completely false. You must come clean with the population and let them make an informed decision. And we don't have that today. I, I mean, there's just so much in there. We could spend a lot of time on it. We don't need to break it down that much. But I mean, I, uh, back to coming clean and the trade-offs, as you kind of talked about it, but coming clean, I mean, uh, really, and, and I know you've done work on it, but really thinking about, well, if you take in the entire um, equation, which is uh, what about the tractors digging the digging the um, you know the minerals out of the ground and then processing them and then shipping them across the ocean liners and then producing the batteries and shipping those back and and all the if you if you add all of that up, is it even saving any carbon? So that'd be one question. And then two, is that even a magical number we should be measuring against? Right, um, well, and that that has trade offs in the number as well. And so. It's really hard to and get three, through. what's the rest of the world going to do with the excess fossil fuels that we no longer right. we no longer quote unquote are using right, right. so I mean uh, uh, let's just take as a, a real example um, the uh, EPA's recent tightening of uh, CO2 emissions from vehicles, which has the de facto consequence of eliminating seventy percent of uh, internal combustion engine production by say 2032 or 2033 I think the number is. Um, we don't have enough battery materials to do that. We just simply don't. It's provable. Um, the very same people mandating the EPA do this are opposing the siting and permitting of new mines. And so this is an impossible task. And so when we talk to our subscribers, 
there's um, what should happen, what can happen, and what will happen. And it's important to know all three of those things. So there's going to be tens of billions of dollars wasted in this regard. And you should not ignore those cash flows when you're measuring securities, equities, bonds, and so on, and their impact uh, you know, uh, accordingly. What can't happen, though, is the policy as stated. And so the path function of the policy, the, the subsequent activity that drives, and then the ultimate running into that wall where people realize like physically impossible can't be done, um, there, those are three distinct phases. And don't confuse this can't be done to, oh, I could just short everything today because there's going to be a, a gusher of cash going into this industry and, and we would be hesitant to short anything in the renewables or, or alternative energy space because Lord knows the price of securities can go anywhere. Um, just because it can't happen in the long term doesn't mean there's all kinds of short term bubbles and all, all sorts of things that we talk about, which again, back to our original point about why we don't give investment advice. We just talk about things in, in these sort of frameworks. Um, there's going to be probably hundreds of billions of dollars um, torched in this effort. And the ultimate effect of that um, is very difficult to model. But it is impossible that 70% of new vehicle production in the U.S. will be electric vehicles by 2032, unless we're producing far less vehicles than we are today, which I suppose is possible. At I think current rate of vehicle the, production. Part of the, part of the yeah, plan. Could be part of the plan, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you can you break down why we won't be able to have enough batteries for those cars, or what that would uh, what the trade off would be? I mean, how much of the earth would we have to dig up? How much damage would that cause? Any way you can kind of break that down in a short version? <laughs> yeah, sure. We we wrote a piece um, called Mission Impossible not that long ago. You know, one of the things one of the great things about being a content creator full time is you could study any of these questions and then write a piece about it. And as you write each of these pieces, you learn more and more. But in the piece, uh, Mission Impossible, we, we walk through the math of, uh, you know, just to give you some raw numbers, right? So the um, Chevy Bolt, which is nobody's dream car. It's a very small electric car, but it has a, a pretty large battery pack. And its battery pack weighs 435 kilograms. Um, you know, and, and and you're rated to get 259 miles uh, on a full charge. And just to give you a sense of the energy density difference here, um, that 259 miles in the equivalent Chevy Cruze um, is 22 kilograms. So, you know, the gas tank um, in an in internal combustion engine weighs 1 20th uh, of that of, of, of a battery in a Chevy Bolt. And we're looking at, you know, depending on which of the, the so-called green metals, um, you're looking at upwards of 40-fold increase in demand. Um, for these metals in order to make any realistic market penetration possible. Um, we quote some numbers in that piece um, from, um, uh, from, from Wood McKenzie, who is one of the sort of um, renewable energy uh, experts, and then the International Energy Agency as well. Um, and, and it's just insane to think that we could go, you know, um, here's a direct quote, mineral demand for use in EVs and battery storage as a major force growing at least 30 times to 2040. Lithium sees the fastest growth with a, with a demand growing by 40 times. Um, cobalt and nickel around 20 to 25 times. Our common sense would tell you, Mark, are we siting and permitting and growing new mine construction at a rate that will lead to a order of magnitude increase in the amount of these materials that we're producing? Of course we're not. And another, and and even another if question we were, would be what damage would be done to the earth to even get that amount, even if we were siting and permitting. I mean, how many gallons you know, of water go into getting the lithium out of the ground or how many acres of land or et cetera, right? Forget about gallons of water. In the piece, we show a picture of one of the giant earth-moving machines that's used in the mining industry. And um, it's an 800-ton shovel, basically. Right. And it, it comes complete with a 4,650-gallon diesel fuel tank, right? I mean, it just makes sense. If you have a 1% or 2% ore and your objective is to dig that stuff out of the ground, move it to a central location, crush it with ball bearings down to a fine particle size, float it with all kinds of toxic chemicals to make a concentrate, 10, 20, 30, 40% of your desired metal, send that metal on a rail car to a smelter where you use a massive amount of energy to melt it down and separate all these things and make pure metal that then goes on to you know, ultra purification so that it can work in the tight specifications of a battery and then you make your cells, which are assembled into packs, 
and then sent to an automotive. Like when you add up all of the energy and waste and toxic chemicals that go into mining and purifying and smelting and, and the construction of battery materials compared to drilling into the ground and getting relatively pure oil that goes to a refinery. And from that refinery, you get diesel, jet fuel, gasoline, asphalt for the roads, lubricants, uh, feedstocks for the chemical industry, and so on and so on and so on. The two just can't compete. Right. Now, you can mandate it. You can declare physics doesn't work. And everyone could nod their heads and say physics doesn't work, more yield, 1984 style. And that's what we're going to do. But it's not going to mean that it's actually going to happen. You know, we wrote a piece um, called Transition to Nowhere about this amazing lithium deposit that was found in Maine. And the most unfortunate thing for this lithium deposit and the owners of it is it's 10 miles as the crow flies from a nice ski resort. Mm. That mine is never going to be permitted or open. Right. Because the exact same environmentalists who are plugging in their Teslas while they go ski on the weekend in the parking lot of the resort are going to be standing outside of that mine and protesting its permitting. And so that which can't go on forever usually doesn't. Um, if something is impossible, it can't happen. But that doesn't mean the path functions from here to there uh, won't be interesting and unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, back to the kind of point you made earlier, just just not full disclosure. And I mean, there's all, it, it seems so complicated. It seems like it might almost be impossible to get to the full dis full disclosure. But of course, we're not anywhere close to that. I was even reading how even just like to make a Tesla, for example, you have like an aluminum frame versus most cars have a steel frame, and how much more energy goes into producing the aluminum frame compared to a steel frame. I mean, yeah, one of the challenges with aluminum. Um, you know, there's, there's a benefit to it because it's lighter, which means it consumes far less um, energy over the lifetime of the car. So there's an energy payback calculation. And that's not just with Teslas. Any of these electric vehicles are pretty uh, interesting in that regard. But again, uh, when you're talking about, you know, aluminum casting for the automotive sector, then you need magnesium because um, these are actually sort of composites. Um, and um, who controls the magnesium supply chain? You want to guess? I don't know. Ch China. No, of course. We gave it away because make the you know the mining of magnesium is incredibly dirty and yeah. inefficient and and so yeah it it um, in fact we wrote again not I have all these pieces sort of in my head photographically um, the piece we wrote back more than a year ago is called magnesium PI if you want to look that one up where we walk through the critical role of magnesium in the production of aluminum and and how aluminum is needed for light weighting so that we can kick our fossil fuel habit and because. The mining and processing of magnesium is very, very dirty. We don't do it in our backyard anymore. And guess who took over 90% of the magnesium market? China. Of course. So uh, you know, that's just, again, another example of, um, of not in my backyard thinking leading to a situation where all roads lead back to China. And by the way, when you go to these facilities in China, um, let's just say you wouldn't want to live near them. Right. And then, and then something about even the, the heat that has to be used in order to get it and the, the process to use that uh, aluminum, just how much more energy intensive that is, like how much more energy that consumes to produce that, then that still has to be offset, I guess, right? Yeah, well, we're seeing aluminum smelters closing down in Germany. We're working on a piece about the deindustrialization of Germany, and I think they've lost something like half of their smelting capacity in the past 18 months as a result of this energy crisis. Right. And so, again, um, this is all going to China. So, yeah. Well, I think uh, I had more questions here, but I think that's probably a pretty good place to wrap it up right there. Um, I uh, I do appreciate your uh, as we as we kind of talked about, you know, your ability to kind of just openly discuss it and, and be be upfront and honest about it. Um, while certainly there are some disagreements, particularly around the Bitcoin piece uh, specifically, but a lot of it's just opinion because none of us know the future, right? So yeah, exactly. you, you draw some yeah. assumptions that you think could play out and I see those playing out differently, but neither of us know the future. So um, those are more opinions as opposed to disagreeing over facts, potentially. Um, and uh, and yeah, we don't know. Indeed. indeed. And you know, if, if we're wrong, we'll be the first to admit it. And yeah. the same with you, I, I suspect. And look, I just want to say, um, as we wrap up, you're always a pro. Really appreciated the invite back on. Enjoyed my first appearance. Enjoyed this one even more. And um, keep up the good work and, and really enjoy the conversation. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, for everyone listening, uh, he's <laughs> he's dropped all the all the issues he's put out. They're all great. Uh, we're gonna make sure to link it. I'm gonna have to get get good at that. Remember my pieces. Uh, I'm gonna link to uh, link to that down below for everybody that's listening. Uh, you should definitely check it out. You have a free subscription and a paid subscription. I I pay. Um, so check that out. Um, yeah. Anything else that you want to talk about? 
That'll do it. And looking forward to the next one. All right, Doomberg. Uh, then we'll go ahead and sign it off with that. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. All right, that's a wrap. Hopefully you enjoyed this conversation with Doomberg like I did. It was uh, always, always good to talk to him. Very insightful. He is so smart. Check out his newsletter down below. There's a link down below. I subscribe. There's a free subscription. There's a paid one as well if you want that. But let me know what you think about this conversation, what you liked, what you didn't, what you'd like me to dive in more to so I can start trying to fine tune the content that I bring to you. Of course, let me know what you thought in the comments. Like the video. If you don't like it, you can down like it. That's okay. At least tell me why in the comments. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. And that's what I got to your success. I'm out.